Oh, and if Kayla, if you could uh, put the link for the uh, for the live stream, that'd be great. Will do. All right. Oh, and a quick note uh, just for the presenters. So um, when uh, you might not see that many folks in the Zoom, but there will be a good number of folks on YouTube and then a lot of people watch it immediately afterwards. So even though there might be only like 20, 30 people in the in the Zoom, it's a couple hundred people end up catching the, the stream and the posted videos. All right. Okay, so we are we are live now, and let me uh, welcome everybody who's coming in. Looks like, just give me a second. I'm seeing a couple of. Looks like people are starting to come in. Great. Uh, sorry, there's the. Two, two Richards showed up on my screen. That's exciting. Uh, that's double the trouble. Um, all right, I am, let's see. Actually, um, Kayla, I am not seeing any, are you sure you set the, the broadcast to Zoom? Sorry for the technical difficulties for anybody who's watching, but uh, uh, Kayla, could you check to make sure the Zoom thing is open? Yes, you mean the, um, the YouTube? or uh the the zoom webinar oh because there are not any attendees oh i think maybe no ah i just saw we we're broadcasting now to all attendees okay great yeah it looks <laughs> like we we started the youtube stream but not the zoom stream uh, uh there which, we is go. A real, which would be a real shame not to have some of our our top fans who show up in the zoom able to see things so right now now they're coming in true, great true. welcome yep. everybody and apologies to anybody on the on the YouTube stream who had to sit through that fun uh, tech de, uh, debugging. Uh, welcome to the Weights and Biases Deep Learning Salon, everyone. I am going to try something a little bit new this time. Or actually, yeah, uh, we have a poll. So Kayla, there's a poll at the bottom of the screen. If you could uh, share that for the attendees. The poll this time is about attention. So the question is, is attention all you need? Yes, no, or um, what? Which are the three possible questions, uh, the three possible, three possible answers to our provocative poll. Um, so go ahead and answer that, and then we'll share the results uh, when we are in between talks. Uh, so let me uh, first introduce our first speaker. Uh, so our first speaker today is Richard Crabe, who is the founder uh, and CEO of Numeri, which is the hardest data science tournament on the planet, uh, and recently released a new way where you can get paid for your ability to generate high quality signals useful for predicting stock markets. In both cases, you are paid in a novel crypto token based off of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, and it's they've got a really a bunch of really great sort of corporate goals, visions, and mission that I'm excited to chat with Richard about. Uh, and he's also going to tell us a little bit about some of the details, uh, you know, how to participate in this in this tournament and what you can do to make sure you do well. So uh, go ahead and take it away, Richard. Welcome. Okay, well, yeah, thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to uh, first introduce Numerai and then um, share my screen and show you a few things. Um, so the first... Uh, the first thing about Numerai is that we're uh, kind of an open hedge fund. We give away all of our data for free and allow anyone in the world to model the data that we give. So usually it's the last thing a hedge fund would ever do, but Numerai does it because we want to get the best possible talent looking at our data. Um, so it's almost a little bit like a Kaggle competition, if you're familiar with that, um, except all the data is obfuscated. So you have no idea really what you're modeling, but for any good data scientist, you can still find the structure of the data without knowing what the features are. Um, but I did wanna share a little bit about what is unique about um, the stock market. Um, and 
the most common problems that people have uh, with overfitting um, it, in machine learning are kind of somehow way worse in finance. And uh, this isn't very well understood by, by most people. And so I'll try to share some of the, some of the um, so this is your classic uh, back test. Um, it, uh, it has a, a kind of very good historical portion uh, where you trained your model um, and then it just stops working uh, whenever you trade it live. Your performance gets much worse. And this is the common pattern you see. Um, and, uh, you know, on the one hand, yeah, all machine learning pro problems have this. If you, you can easily overfit uh, a face detection algorithm and have, you know, your in-sample performance uh, or even your holdout performance be worse than some other new set that you're shown later. But there is something special about finance where this is very common um, and uh, perplexes a lot of people. Um, so first, just to show you a little bit about numerized data to uh, describe this problem. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, this is a, you can get this on GitHub. It's just a, called our analysis and tips uh, notebook. And it shows the, all the data uh, that we have. This is what it looks like. You have um, all these features and we call them off the Dungeons and Dragons uh, names. And um, you also have a target and the target variable um, and the features are obfuscated to you, but you're trying to basically use these features to model this target. So it seems like a very simple supervised learning problem. And if you treat it that way, uh, you will do quite badly <laughs> because there's a few things that, um, I'm sorry, there's a few things that you're missing. So the first, the first thing to notice is this column called era. Now the big problem with stock market data is time. And uh, there's a lot of uh, problems with the data modeling because all the data is in different times of time periods. And we call these eras on Numeri. And what happens is people, if people ignore the eras, they think their model's a lot better than it really is. And they end up uh, uh, making a model that doesn't generalize very well. And so you have to kind of take care that there, there is this time component. And um, there aren't that many eras. There are only about a um, hundred, hundred and or something eras. And so, when you think about modeling this data, even though there's half a million rows, if there are very few eras, eras are the important thing. Eras are what's unique because in that time section, uh, all everything inside that time section, that era is happening at the same time. So the data isn't uh, independent by row it's only independent by era. So this is over a decade of data, but you actually have um, very little, uh, you actually have very little number of independent observations. So that's one key thing. And then the other key thing is how the features uh, interact with each other. So what happens with most models, going back to this, is during the learning phase, uh, when you train on historical data, what happens is your model will pick up on the best, the best risk for that period, not the best alpha for that period, the best risk for that period. So if it was a period where momentum of, of common stock factor did well, um, or a period where value did well, these things will come out extremely strong in say the coefficient of a linear model that you made. And the trick in some ways with finance is kind of very strange. You have you have to model, you have to create a model that sort of has some co kind of coefficients on the features to predict something. But at the same time, you want the, the coefficients on the features to be as low as possible. And so it's like a strange problem because, um, because you, in some ways, you don't want to have risk exposures to the features uh, because they're really just adding risk and they're not um, adding alpha. So what, what happens uh, on Numeri, a lot of our users uh, do something called feature neutralization. Um, and feature neutralization is, uh, is, we have it in this example script that we give out. If you go to our website, you can download all this data for free and these example scripts. Um, you can, we actually uh, include a, a little bit of code that, uh, that does a, a, 
uh, linear projection. So what this is doing is saying, well, you've built a nonlinear model, right, with a neural net, but I don't want to take on all these linear exposures to what are really just risks. Um, and this does this linear projection, uh, projects out these risks and leaves what's left, the really high quality alpha, the alpha that isn't just something that's in the features um, uh, in a linear way. And what tends to happen if you can uh, take off those features, then suddenly your, your estimates go down. You're like, well, geez, I actually don't have as good a model as I think in sample, but it's actually a model that generalizes very well out of sample. Um, and in most machine learning, typically the feature that you like the most is the feature you really want to keep. But in finance, the feature you like the most is the most dangerous risk that you're exposed to. And uh, you, have to, you have to reduce that risk. Otherwise, your model won't generalize and you'll do extremely badly um, in live data. So that's kind of like a little bit of a secret about, um, about how to make your models generalize in finance. There's so much more to it. Um, and I hope you get to take a look at the data and see some of this uh, for yourself. Thank you. All right, well, uh, yeah, thanks Richard for that quick look at what's, uh, what's up with, uh, with finance data on Numeri. I think the first question that I have is actually, so there's something very unintuitive to me as somebody who comes from science into machine learning about the idea that you'd want to, that you'd want an unsparse model, right? That you'd want, it seems like this neutralizing feature exposure idea, you try and you try and have as many small parameters across as many pieces as possible. And in science, you're often trying to find a sparse linear model rather than a diffuse nonlinear model. So can you comment on why you think there's that big, big gap between what works and is useful in, in science and what works and is useful in finance? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. I mean, the, the, the way to think about it is kind of like that the risks and the, and the alphas are kind of dual. Um, on the one hand, anything you find, any, any exposure you find that you think is an alpha, uh, meaning something that has correlation, subsequent correlation with returns, um, it could just as easily kind of turn around. And, um, and so if you want to operate for, it's almost like you're, you have the assumption of, well, the market's actually efficient to every single feature that I have. Of course it is. Everybody's going to have learned from the past data. So what, what actually will generalize uh, is when I decorrelate myself from those basic factors and make a hedge fund that's quite differentiated from all the exposures that everyone else is taking on. I see. Yeah, because I think the motivation in science is to find a causal model of what's going on. That is, if I if I find something that's sparse, if I apply a sort of like Occam's razor, then I'm finding something that's the real underlying model that causes these uh, the phenomena that I'm observing. But in finance, you don't necessarily want a causal model, right? You want a you want a really good predictive model. Exactly, and and what we see in in our data is if you in some ways, the less you know about your mo how your model works, the better. It's like, it's somehow especially good for, for machine learning. A linear model, like I said, would only have just positive or negative coefficients on the features. And, and if you took those down to zero, you'd have nothing left. But a nonlinear model, there's actually something left and that's often the gold. Um, and that's what we want people to focus on learning because that tends to generalize better. Interesting. Um, and so then how do you see, so there's this idea of neutralizing feature exposure. How does that play into this new numerized signals tool that you're putting out or this new sort of kind of contest? Yeah, so numerized signals is a brand new thing we launched uh, just about two weeks ago. And uh, like I said, with numerai, we give out all of our data. And our data is kind of expensive. It's this high quality data you probably couldn't find, but it's all in this obfuscated way. But there are people out there who maybe have some of their own data already. And they have cobbled together some Yahoo Finance data and combined it with some Bloomberg data. And they've built their own signal out of that. And we want to say, well, if you have a signal like that, you should come to us too. 
uh, we also want signals made on data that isn't ours. And that's what Numerai Signals is. You can come and submit your signal to us and get rewarded for it. But the twist is we are not really looking for a signal that is really correlated with return, really predictive of return. Um, in some sense, we, because we already have a lot of signals that are predictive with return. So if you bring a model that we already have, uh, we kind of think we should pay you zero. Um, but if you bring a model that is uncorrelated from everything we have, i.e. neutral to everything we have, like a projection of everything we have, and also still has alpha, even after we do that neutralization to your signal, then you really have something. And that's much more valuable. And we pay a lot for that. Mm -hmm. I see. So then, uh, so how do you generate, I guess, so if I'm sitting here at home making my, uh, my signal that I want to send to Numerai, like what, what kinds of things can I do to ensure that, that what I think is valuable is also what you guys are going to think is valuable. Like how do I, how do I seek alpha, so to speak? Yeah, no, it is, it is something of a black box. Um, what we do say is anything basic probably won't work. So we have no surprise. We have the PE ratio of every single stock in the world and we have it for 15, 18 years or so. So if you come with, and you just start submitting the PE ratios of stocks, we will neutralize that by RPE. You'll have nothing left and you won't, you won't do well. But if you create a complicated model and it's on unusual data, uh, then you're very likely to have a good portion of that be orthogonal to the models produced on Numerai and the data that we have. So basically it's like, don't give us something you know, kind of everyone has, and then you'll be, you'll be good. Um, so, I mean, perhaps some of this stuff is, is per proprietary information, but what do you, do you have any examples of signals that have been useful in this tool so far or like a, a prototypical example to share? Well, we have been surprised by some of them. Um, we thought, we thought it was kind of, so Numerai we say is the hardest data science tournament in the world because you have to deal with all these problems. It's not just like downloading a, a Kaggle data set and building an XG boost. There's a lot more to think about and it goes deep. Um, and that's why we have users who've been there for many years. Um, but signals, we were very surprised to see that in the first few days of it, there were people uploading signals that were very orthogonal and um, had a lot more orthogonal uh, than we could even like make ourselves um, if, we if we really tried. Um, so the, it does seem like, and there's some people in Japan that are really strong. Um, there are also some people, uh, you know, from Numerai itself who've started building signals. So I think we're pretty surprised and um, who knows what data sets they're using to create these, right? We don't know. They never give us their model or their data. They're only giving us the output of their signal. So it's kind of cool in a way. Like we don't really know what they're doing to generate these things. I see. Interesting. Maybe, uh, so I guess one of the famous examples of the application of machine learning in finance uh, was you know predicting crop yields months ahead of time using satellite data. I forget who the people were who who did that. I don't know if you recall, um, but uh, that so is that the kind of thing that generates the signals that you would be interested in, uh, or is it maybe a little bit more financial data? Yeah, that I think that is always kind of like a, that's a bigger story than it's like real. Uh, the 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 main alternative data uh, that you want is going to apply to lots of stocks. And so if someone told me something about one stock, that's not a quant model, that's not a signal. That's just someone's stock tip. And Numerai signals isn't for that. It's for like broad cross-sectional, you, you have some data that applies to 5,000 stocks. And it could be some NLP signal based off Twitter or it could be anything, but usually it's gotta be really broad for it to be valuable. Because we never put the fund in one stock, right? So we, we need right, broad. Right, right, certainly. That seems that seems. I don't know that much about finance, but that <laughs> sounds like that sounds like a bad idea. Yeah. Uh, 
Uh, we have, so we got a question in the Q and A, and I actually encourage folks uh, watching on YouTube and folks in Zoom to post in the in the Q and A or in the live chat uh, to ask questions, and I'll and I'll forward them to Richard. Uh, so the question is, you know, how is this orthogonality assessed? Um, like what, you know, you've given a couple of examples of, of ways to think about what this ortho orthogonality means and sort of uniqueness or originality. What more can you say about that? Well, that, that code I shared earlier was super, you know, uh, high level, but the code is exactly what we use, but we do it with every single feature that we have. So there are about 310 features that we have. And they're also what we call like nine risk factors, like country risk or sector risk, or um, because if someone posts a model that it really only did well just because it had exposure to the tech industry and the tech industry happened to do well, that's again, not what we're looking for. Um, so uh, it's, it is, and, and mathematically it's, it's making this uh, linear projection. It's regressing out all the linear exposures that you have to the things we have and your what's remaining is what's uh, what's valuable to us. I see. Um, so yeah, so you mentioned, I guess, yeah, NLP signals maybe of of behavior of users on social media. Um, those sound like uh, those sound like useful features. Any other thoughts about what what things might be orthogonal? Yeah, I think NLP is quite a big one. It's one I'm like quite excited about. Um, we have, we actually did buy some news sentiment data, but they kind of mess it up. And if you look at it from like, if we, whenever we go talk to a new data vendor, they say, oh, we have all this data. We test it. It's got no original compared to what we already have. Um, so uh, I like that we're putting it out to the world and saying, you know, you can, anyone can kind of be a data vendor to us and provide anything. Mm. But NLP is the one I'm kind of the most excited about. And we have a user who's, who's really experienced with NLP and has uh, even written some numeri jokes with GPT-3 uh, before uh, to show us. And, and I, I think it's not really, I kind of, I kind of, yeah, like I said, I'm quite skeptical of like the alternative data craze. There's a lot you can do with kind of very good modeling on normal data. And there's a lot of text out there that companies have to produce about their funds or have to make statements um, about their companies. So mining that data, that, because it's already quite structured, I think there's quite a lot even there uh, that we wouldn't have and that would do well. Yeah, I guess what I'm what I'm kind of aiming at is uh, you in your Numeri Signals blog post on on Medium, you asked sort of uh, where is the next Ken Griffin, and it seemed like one of the motivations you had was this idea that that you know the power of crowds of people in garages with internet connections to like find signals. So I guess, um, like, yeah, what what do you think? Those next Ken Griffins. It seems like alternative data sources aren't the aren't the right thing. But what do you think those next Ken Griffins are and should be working on? Well, the the other side of um, of it is that uh, Numeri signals is just one week long predictions, whereas mm -hmm. Numera is one month long. And so there's actually a lot of things that work on a one week time horizon that would not work on a one month horizon. And a lot of that is actually technical. Uh, data, which is data that's kind of built from the price series. And oftentimes you can be, you can have a very good technical model, but because it trades so often, uh, you don't really make money off the costs. But mm -hmm. technical features would be great. Uh, and we don't have uh, lots of technical features at Numeri. And so I would say what's quite nice about that is anyone can make those. You just need the price. And there's very easy access to get the price data. And then you can make your own technical features. So I think a lot of models will be like that. Interesting. Um, what do you think the next sort of, you know, short term, shorter term than the master plan of building the last hedge fund? Um, what are sort of the shorter term ways you want to extend either the core data science tournament or the signals product? Well, it's, yeah, it's just two weeks old. It's doubling every week so far, uh, it's, but it's just two weeks. Um, we think there will be a lot of staking there. There's the, the way Numeri works is you stake your models. Numeri has $5 million or so, maybe $4.5 million staked. Signals 
just started, but has $24,000 staked. Um, a year ago, all of Numero put together was $20,000 staked. So it's really grown a lot. And um, uh, the main focus is on those two things for now in the medium term. Um, and, you know, the one thing we've also been building for, for a while, and we haven't um, taken on uh, capital to our fund. So at some point next year, we'll probably do that. Um, but ultimately, the fund is really just for institutional investors, and uh, it's not really open to the public or our users. Um, but I think the exciting thing is, you know, is the master plan, the monopolized intelligence, number one, monopolized data, number two, which is what signals is about getting external data in. And the third thing is monopolized money. Uh, mm -hmm. and so we're kind of going step by step. Mm. Um, so, uh, there's this investor who you may have heard of. He uh, lives in Nebraska, so you might not have heard of him, but Warren Buffett who says that you should only invest in companies that have moats. So what do you think are, like, as you mentioned, you know, Monopolize shows up in the master plan of Numeri a couple of times. So what do you think allows you to sort of build those moats to protect your monopolies in, um, in data uh, and in intelligence? Well, I think you can make, um, you know, monopoly, it's some like it has negative connotations, but it's a kind of good word, I think, for what we're trying to say. Um, we don't, we want to be the best data science community and the most uh, high paying and rewarding community. Um, and we've already paid out over $40 million to our data scientists. There are a number of millionaires from Numeri, and not only people know that. And I think the community is the whole thing. We don't trade our own model. Every, if you decide to rip your data out of signals, we don't have it anymore. If you decide to pull your model out of Numeri, we don't have it anymore. So we're really relying on the fact that we can make these incentives that bring a community together. And because they're staking and engaged and making a lot more than they could in other ways, it's gonna get really big. And, um, and they won't be a reason to, to quit. Um, and I do like, and it's kind of like to a Bitcoin, like you can think of our users almost as being the miners of Bitcoin or something. And uh, they're, mm -hmm. they're da doing data mining on our data and then they're earning our cryptocurrency. And it's very sticky once you get a lot of miners. It's suddenly, well, this mm -hmm. is the best place to be. Why would I move? And I, I think that's happening with us. And I think a lot of our users like it for that reason. I see. And in some ways, an even better analogy than to the Bitcoin miners would be to the Bitcoin traders, right? To the people who have been like trading various forms of various coins and tokens. So do you see that as one of your sort of competitors for mind share and users? Or what, um, like, what would you say are some of your uh, like competitors, if, if there are any? Yeah, I do have a kind of a pet hatred of, uh, of crypto traders, actually. Um, they even call themselves uh, DGENs, um, uh, but uh, they're they, not very likable. Like <laughs> it's not something they aim for, it seems. Yeah, yeah, and they're not super focused on the long term or the consequences of their actions. But that's fine. Um, the I think you know ultimately the equity markets are a lot sort of better for the world. Um, than the crypto markets. And I, if you were an expert trader at Ponzi schemes, I don't think you should be proud of yourself. Um, uh, you, you know, no matter how good you are, you're doing, you're doing the wrong thing. So yeah, but yeah, I think some of our users are very interested in crypto. Obviously we have a cryptocurrency, so I don't hate crypto all through and through. I love the applications of crypto and the fact that you can use it to build communities and do things like staking. But um, yeah, we need to compete with uh, the mindshare of uh, the DeFi DGENs and some of the people, mm. there's been some crypto projects that sort of say, you can just stake your cryptocurrency here and do nothing and earn 300% a year. And uh, it's like, okay, well, that, how does that work long-term? And everyone's mm. like, we don't really care how about the long-term. So I think for Numeri, whenever people are using Numeri and staking on Numeri, it's much more about the long-term and it's much more about doing something like real. Um, one last question uh, from Michael in the Zoom Q&A. 
Are you, do you see the quality of the meta model that is that is sort of generated by the data science tournament, tournament improve over time? Do you think there's a limit? And do you expect the same thing to happen with the output of the Signals project? There is a very strange thing happening with uh, the meta model. So the meta model combines all the numeri models together. And if you look at it over the last year, it's climbing. Not every week, some weeks it'll drop down, someone pulls their model out or something, but it's climbing kind of linearly. And you really should think there's like an asymptote to this, right? And we haven't been changing the data. So it's not like it's going up because of the data. We've given out some tips and validation data and other things, but it's quite impressive to me how it's still going up. And so I really like that idea of, you know, even if we did nothing, the community would make everything better um, without us releasing features. And that's the problem with most hedge funds. They, they find it hard to scale because they always have to be running out, buying new data, trying new things. And it's, it's very chaotic, but Numeri, it's kind of even more chaotic, but the incentives keep it all aligned. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, well, that's, that's good to hear. I'm excited to, you know, I think collaboration is a really important uh, thing that both the machine learning community and the finance community could do better on. So I'm glad to, to hear from somebody who's, who's putting so much into making that work well. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, all right. Well, thanks for, uh, thanks for coming on. Uh, and, uh, you know, feel free to stick around. You mentioned that NLP on, on data and alternative data was an important uh, skill. Uh, and that's actually what we'll be hearing about next from our next speaker, Alexa Milosevic. Uh, before we do that, I did want to do a quick promo here for the upcoming salon. So let me share my screen and we will talk about that. So the next salon uh, is in two weeks. And so it's November 10th, same time, five o'clock Pacific. Uh, the two speakers, one will be Chirag Agarwal. So he'll be talking about variants of gradient, a new technique for detecting outliers and estimating example difficulty. We had the other author on just two weeks ago, Sarah Hooker, uh, but she ended up having to talk about one of her other really exciting papers on the hardware lottery. Uh, so Chirag's coming along to talk about this, this, this variants of gradient paper. And then I'll be giving a talk. I, uh, I also talked, uh, I guess Sarah was maybe a month ago. I also talked two weeks ago uh, and I had so much fun, I think I'm going to do it again, about what you can learn by learning to multiply by one with machine learning, using that as a sort of, of demo or a basic question, a toy example, if you will. Uh, then, uh, just so you know, that we do these salons every two weeks. There's lots of great ones out there. I mentioned the one with Sarah, Sarah Hooker. Uh, we've had... Uh, we had Hannes Hopka from SAP Concur. You can see that it, this all these are recorded and put on our YouTube channel, where you can uh, where you can review them. So that's weights and biases on YouTube.com. And if you want to engage with the community that comes to these events, that ask the questions, uh, the we gather together on a Slack forum, uh, the weights and biases forum, bit.ly/slack/forum. We have people on uh, Anthony Goldblum, the CEO of Kaggle, came and talked. Uh, Piero Molino, who's at Uber working on their AutoML solution, came and chatted with folks. Um, uh, Robert Nishihara, who is the CEO of uh, AnyScale, is a lurker in our forum and occasionally emoji reacts to people's posts. Uh, so we've got a lot of interesting folks in the forum and you could be one of them if you come through. Uh, so that's all I had to share about our community. Uh, one of those community members is here today. That is Alexa Milosevic, who is here to talk about a really cool tool for the automation of project management workflows with natural language processing. So Alexa is going to tell us a little bit about how they made this tool, this Jarvis tool, uh, run blazing fast without hurting its accuracy. So I'm really excited to learn some of these tips. Um, and actually, I, I hate to do this, but I do want to end the poll and share the results just before we do this. Speaking of natural language processing, the controversial question in NLP these days is, is attention all you need? Uh, so that is, is the attention mechanism, which is used uh, to uh, sort of learn a kind of short-term memory, 
uh, applicable to natural language. Is this the only thing that you need? It's what powered GPT-3. I was chatting with one of the authors of GPT-3 this weekend, and we had a big fight about this. Uh, and so uh, he believes attention probably is very close to all you need. It looks like from our uh, results that uh, the people who, who are familiar with this question on it by a five to one ratio think it is not. Uh, so thanks everybody for answering my provocative poll. Uh, and thanks Alexa for coming in. Go ahead and take it away. Yes, just a second, let me share my screen. Okay, here it is. So. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Alexa and I am co-founder and CEO of Jarvis and uh, I will be talking to you about how we uh, made our project management software uh, run with NLP fast and how we actually don't even need UI that much anymore since we started using NLP this way. So first of all, we've all been witnessing some of the big milestones happening, especially in the last few years uh, in NLP. And especially since BERT came out, there has been some increased interest in conversational AI. Uh, and with this increased interest came more NLP in production. So conversation, it slowly started turning from, is this even possible to how can we make it better and faster and actually run in production? So with Jarvis, we've encountered many problems related to, especially to inference speed. So we had to solve them fast to, just so we can get them to our users. And first I will talk a bit about what is Jarvis and why the speed is this important to us. So Jarvis automates repetitive parts of project management using natural language processing and makes getting information in and out of the software available with a single sentence. And since there is a gap between what employees want and that is the focus on their work and what managers want to have as much information to draw conclusions from, this gap becomes even wider and wider with remote and asynchronous work. So as we can see on these graphs, what we do is try to take away all the communication between managers, managers and employees, employees themselves, and go, go through Jarvis, uh, all of this communication and data processing so that we can just walk, work remotely and asynchronous. And we do this with a system of smart notifications from which you can update work through either text or voice and receive status updates without even slightest need to go to UI and fill out forms. So we analyze all this information and present it to manager uh, in a way that they can find useful and draw conclusions from. And when you compare this to the current process, which requires you to manually search, enter and submit everything, this requires and requires managers to either make sure uh, everybody did this uh, or they had to work with incomplete data, we, we can notice like how much time can be saved. But to do this, we, we have to have our conversational AI actually work in real time. And for this, and not only real time, but of course be accurate. Uh, and for this to be possible, we need both accuracy and speed to be going for us. So if I'm to be honest, our first version of Jarvis we were first of all uh, researchers and then, and then I guess uh, gotten more into the development. So we started thinking like researchers and let's, let's see what's the best accuracy we can get. So we started just, just badly when it comes to productionizing that model that we were making. And we bought into the hype and thought we could do everything with a large do it all transformer with some like additional layers, like fine tuning and everything. And we've written all the code sequentially, especially like the pre and post processing code. So we didn't really care about anything away from that model. So we were just uh, being like, okay, you know, we will build one big model with all the data that we have gathered crumbed up into it. And this will give us great result because all of this data is connected and all of these tasks are connected. And we did get good accuracy, but our whole process from users sending the message to them receiving the response, it took around 10 seconds. And that's only for one conversation. If there are like concurrent conversations going on, this request takes even longer and performance just started rapidly going down. So we knew we had to improve this and that we couldn't do like full production with this type of model. And I mean, first thing that comes to, my, to, to our mind in this case is just, you know, we were testing this out on CPU. Let's see how it works on, cheap, CP, on GPU and see if this is a good enough option. And it, it did improve, 
but not nearly enough uh, for this option to be viable because it will be a lot expensive since we would still have to have a lot of GPUs for a lot of concurrent conversations. And we also like try to code things a little differently, like factorizing the code wherever we can, list comprehensions, generators, just trying to follow, I guess, good practices when it comes to running the Python code faster. But the thing is that we, we, we were using too much data science where we didn't have to, and especially machine learning. And we uh, weren't specializing parts of our system enough. We wanted to do everything sequentially, going to our big model that works so great. And I mean, everybody gets excited when they get this one big model that can do so many things. But we, we knew we couldn't get this to users and get them to use it this way. So we had to stay back and think, how can we redesign the system to work better for us? And the little things that we didn't care about during the research really started to matter when it comes to using this model in production. So wherever it didn't like wherever it didn't hurt, uh, hurt the accuracy what we started doing is breaking down the models into like atomic inference so uh, what i mean by that is we actually wanted uh, one model to do its specific thing uh, and like th the lowest possible specific thing like if if we can boil it down to simple classification that's what we are do do just going with and uh, we, we a bit stepped away from uh, deep learning for some of the models. Some of them, of course, still have to use it, especially like uh, those bird-based models. And even like in some parts, we even like totally st stood away from machine learning data science. And, uh, oh, and some we just did like statistical models, let's say. And what it turns out is, is not that it only made it faster, but it, only, but it also made it a bit more accurate uh, when we use statistical models where we can. So, but I mean, of course, when, when there is context involved and everything we can't, but for example, if we have to match like closest the name to the one that was misspelled, statistical models will still better than that. Or, and like, unless we want to do like complete, uh, like, like for English names, we can do that, but for some names that aren't that common in data sets, we, we had to do some statistical models. And the second thing we did is just what I mentioned. So moved away from, from deep learning when needed and when possible. Uh, we also started harnessing power of concurrency. And this is where a lot of time has to be spent, just thinking which parts can actually be done concurrently because some parts are uh, do have like some sort of relationship where you have to do them sequentially. But it's, it's actually much more common that you can do concurrent uh, things uh, that, that just speed up things a lot. And in our case, we also moved away from Python to go to Go for, for non-machine learning stuff. Or of course, for machine learning, we still kept Python. And this improves our speed incredibly because it harnessed uh, innate concurrency that Go has. But I mean, if somebody is more comfortable with Python, there are also like Cython and some other solutions, Spacey, uh, that, that speed up is execution in Python without having to like, change the language. So with all this in place, we had already improved our model considerably, but as number of concurrent requests grew, we wanted to do something more just in case so that we wouldn't fall again into the same uh, thing that we had before where we thought we were good enough, but then it turns out when, it, when the number of requests increases, we are not. So what we, what we wanted to just just check out how can we actually uh, build this uh, inference to be better. So until now we have building everything around the models themselves to be better and like breaking them down and everything. But we wanted to see if we can also make those models work faster and infer uh, everything that we've trained them faster. And some of the things that we tried next, uh, first we started using TVM on AWS. And this helped model inference speed, but we wanted to see if we can push it further. Uh, so we tried Onyx uh, runtime, which turned out to have like massive impact on us. And for those who might not be familiar with this, Onyx is a format representing ML models and the Onyx runtime uh, is a high performance engine for running these models. And it sped us and it, it sped like our inference drastically 
So much so that right now, uh, for each of our models, it's around 10 milliseconds inference. And for some of them, it's in like single digits uh, for some of the simpler models. And uh, this makes the whole conversation look completely real time. Like even if we have a lot of pre-processing and post-processing after that inference, uh, it, still, it still helps a lot to make it like completely real time. And another thing that we would like to try soon as we start implementing, especially like document summarization, question answering, and some more complex feature is uh, TensorRT to see if this can speed us up even more. Um, and if someone has good insight on how this works with transformers models, uh, please do tell us uh, so, so we would know if we can, uh, if we should pursue it through further. And yeah, thank you for attention. And if you would like to hear more about Jarvis or chat about machine learning and conversational AI in general, you can reach out either by email or my Twitter uh, border stated here. And yeah, now I guess we're moving to QA. Yeah, great. Uh, thanks a lot for the talk, Alexa. And uh, yeah, I encourage folks who uh, are in the Zoom or on the YouTube, uh, in the YouTube chat to post their questions as we're going. I've got lots of questions. I'm very excited to ask them. So uh, the first thing I'd like to ask is sort of towards the end there, more of a detail oriented question, but uh, why did you choose the ONNX format? Like what, um, like what made you look into that originally? And also what may, what do you, what do you think is the secret behind why I was able to give you that big performance boost? Yeah, so uh, it wasn't like the format itself, uh, but like it, it's actually the ONX uh, runtime, which Microsoft developed and they especially updated it uh, like a year ago, I think for BERT, uh, which, which we are using underneath. So they even like, I mean, this was in research settings in like their lab settings, but they got like nearly 20 times improvement on both CPU and GPU. Uh, so that got us going. We didn't get, let's say, that much, but we still got like five to 10 times X, which is pretty, pretty good. And we are right now able to even run it on CPU. Like we don't need any GPUs for, for the inference. Mm -hmm. I see. Uh, yeah, because I guess, so I have come across the ONNX format only as just sort of this attempt to get everybody to play nicely with each other by sort of some of the people coming into the field later, right? You've got TensorFlow and, and PyTorch both have their solutions. And then it seems like a lot of other people have been like, okay, can we agree on an open format? So it's actually, this is great news to me to hear that the open format can also also bring you these uh, performance, performance benefits. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, Microsoft is the one pushing that format especially. So mm -hmm. that's probably why they, they created this runtime. But mm -hmm. when, when, we, when we like research a bit deeper, this runtime really, really helps. Uh, that's cool. It's, it's, that's a nice, that's a nice detail uh, about, about operating these things that I was not aware of. Um, you mentioned being able to deploy just to CPU being important. Is that mostly just to reduce cloud costs or is this something that you can see maybe running on unspecialized hardware in phones or something like that? Yeah. So we, we right now are doing this on AWS and we are just trying to reduce the cost as much as possible. And I mean, we didn't even need that last steps that I like put the, the like the last slide. We still have it like real time even without that. Uh, so when we implemented this, this made it like it gave us a lot of space to just go completely away from GPU for now at least. Uh, but yeah, at some point it would be great to just be able to also do it on the phone directly so that you don't have to actually have an internet connection to like, I mean, if you're on the airplane and you can't, you, you just remember something so that you can do it right away and then it gets uploaded when you get connected to the Wi-Fi. So mm -hmm. that is something that, that we are looking into. I see. Yeah, you also mentioned the sort of, one of the pieces of the transition from your original application to the second application, the like more performant one, was you moved from one like single almighty transformer model to many small models. So this is something that it seems to have been coming up like quite a bit 
in a lot of the conversations I've been having with folks on the salon that people are moving over to these multi-model model amalgamation type pipelines. So I was just wondering if you'd comment a little bit more about that process, what worked well, what didn't, what were the pain points and the tools that you used to, to, to switch over your, your pipeline? Because it's quite a different thing to manage a zoo of models than a single one. Yeah, yeah. So uh, at first, uh, let's say we, we saw uh, that a lot of people uh, in the beginning, since we started working on this in the early 2019, so a lot of people at that time uh, were just taking it straight away. It was probably hype, but everybody was like, yeah, this is a silver bullet. So we were, we were like kind of onto that hype. And then we saw that I think Sonos acquired the company uh, for like 50 million did use especially like just one model and like they used one joint model for like a bunch of NLP tasks and we were like you know if, if they can build it that good to be actually acquired I mean there must be something there so we started just going straight to to the joint model that does like a bunch of other tasks uh, but like as, as as we went going on about it we noticed that a lot of those things can do, be done concurrent like concurrently so what in, instead of actually just going everything sequentially to that one model, we started building a lot of models that can be done uh, in different uh, like timestamps. Uh, and we did like, I guess we did have to work a bit more on the architecture since we have to have like, we have gRPC communicating between those microservices and everything. So we did have to uh, do a bit more uh, architecture designing in it and just implementation details, but it helped us uh, even, even with all the networking costs between those models, it still, it still helped us a lot with the speed. Mm, I see. Uh, but that is, I guess, the biggest thing I see as somebody who's more of a like machine learning researcher than a machine learning engineer or an ML ops person, that seems like a pretty big hurdle to come over this like ops problem of integrating that whole pipeline. So it seemed at first actually, but it's not like once you build a, a communication between two services, uh, the rest become like incrementally simpler. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of code that you can basically just copy out. That's like for the communication and we completely removed states from most of these things. So mm -hmm. we didn't actually have to save states uh, at any point. It was just basically kicking the states around. So a bunch of codes was similar, just receiving the state, then packing it up for the next thing. So it, 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 even though it seems like at first as, as a big hurdle to overcome, it's actually not. It, we, we did it like in, in less than a month, just switch mm -hmm. into that. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of related to a, another broader question that I wanted to ask. You mentioned that early on you were effectively doing like too much data science, too much machine learning, right? So yeah. how do we take some of these, you know, and you eventually learned the lesson to kind of pair that back, right? So how do we take like that lesson and the lesson of like, it's a good idea to have multiple smaller services communicating with each other and sort of incorporate them maybe earlier in our workflow. Because when I talk to people, it seems like they all, like a lot of them have that same trajectory of pairing things away and adding more like of a complicated ML ops structure. So what do you think we can do to get those earlier in our development cycle? Yeah, so I mean, for us, it was, it was just, I guess, um, trying it out and seeing what works, what doesn't, and probably like everything won't work the same for everybody, but just trying to, to think, what can you break down as, as for the like multiple, like which parts can you break down into simpler problems? Like you don't have to have a silver bullet and you mo usually can't have a silver bullet for everything. So just trying to think what, what can you and how can you break down this problem into uh, much more like smaller problems. And then also are those smaller problems actually best solved this way? So don't think uh, like, just, just try not to go with the, with the, the feeling, let's say, but actually the reasonable explanation. So we were like, yeah, machine learning is totally going to kill it here. But it turns out that it doesn't. And like statistical models are much better uh, matching like misspelled names mm -hmm. than, than any deep learning or even like basic machine learning model. So mm -hmm. just, just, so just, just a quick clarification. When you say statistical models, are you talking about things like 
I don't know, like mark like in Markov models for language, or do you just mean like uh yeah, like probability like forming a probability distribution over tokens? Like what are you talking about here? Yeah, like uh, what we used was Jero Winkler. So like or like Levenstein's distance. So something something that's yeah, that, that's not really uh it's not even I guess a, a complete model. It's just computing what what's the closest to something else in some sort of way. I see. I see. Yeah. So often people say that ML can replace the need for hand engineered features, right? So like the SIFT features or Laplacian pyramids for images. I know a little bit more about images than I do about NLP. So those are the examples that immediately come to mind. Like those have been effectively replaced in a lot of Miles models by like the first couple layers of a ConfNet essentially. But that doesn't mean that there aren't tons of places where actually doing something like that and pulling out those nice features can get you really good performance on one part of what your model needs to do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I actually started as a computer, uh, like vision uh, engineer as mm -hmm. well. So mm -hmm. when, when it comes to that part, uh, even though for like for hand gestures, we did use uh, deep learning. So, uh, but like for, for some kind of, uh, to actually de detect uh, some things uh, like movement or something like that, we used a bit simpler uh, models. So, I mean, it was like five years ago, so I'm not that like great remembering exact details, but I actually do have like a patent for a shelf during that time. But yeah, I, I, I'm much more into natural language processing right now. Yeah, so I guess I did want to get a little bit of your opinions on what's going on in natural processing these days, natural language processing these days. So the like the zeitgeist now seems to be like transformers transformers are it we just need to get like the attention mechanism we need to find a way to make that efficient then we need to scale that up work with internet scale data like you know gpt3 uh is the move now we just need to make it smaller do you think this is the a, a good direction for the nlp community to move in do you think this is is the right one so i think it depends on what actually you want nlp to do so if you need NLP to just analyze the text, extract some information from it, and uh, like like just those th that sort of things, that the transformer can be really great. But just like you said, like getting more data, making it more sophisticated, and everything. But I don't think it's a solution to a broader problem of language. So I don't think that actually mm -hmm. it can solve uh, communication that it that isn't let's say even, even like you don't know what's going to happen it's not really predefined but it's not like an actual conversation going on since like it can just spew out anything that it read from the internet which can be good bad terrible it is, so whatever is the most common connection with something else so it's it's not like it's not reason reason uh, communication per se i see so do you think that that is something, some of that comes from the choice of using the cross entropy loss, this sort of like contrastive learning thing where you're trying to say, okay, like predict this next token by using all these negative examples of like, it's not, you know, uh, you know, masking things, all these kinds of, uh, of approaches. So do you think, do you think that's an architectural limitation or do you think that's a problem specification limitation there? So for me, I think it's actually like the problem specification since it's it's mm -hmm. completely different to have some sort of um, real reasoning uh, to, to get mm -hmm. to real reasoning from that. What you can do is uh, analyze a lot of things that humans already like. You can use tools that humans already use to pack it up and get something new there, but you can't actually. Uh, I, at least for me, can build totally out of the box. Like it can be something that mm. satisfies the the closest possible thing you want to get to, but not nothing like I'm. I'm uh, so I'm not sure like how to explain what where I'm going at. But like in manufacturing, you see like those shapes that get really good results and everything, but they're just trying to satisfy a goal that was given to them. But they can like really think out of the mm. box and be like. Maybe we don't actually need this thing at all. Maybe we can build something completely different. Like that, that is lacking for me. I see. Yeah. So this, yeah, related to the sort of problem of, uh, you know, out of distribution generalization, sort of rule abstraction, things that people are finding computer vision models approaching, like the problem of, of 
self-driving uh, have also run into like the, that kind of, of difficulty or issue. Yeah. Pretty much, I'm, I haven't like been researching that much uh, self-driving per se. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. I think self-driving can work great if a lot of self-driving cars are out there and they communicate between themselves and everything is great. Uh, but I, I haven't researched enough to talk about like a real world scenario where there's like a bunch of random things going on. Mm -hmm. uh, but but in natural language and or like uh, in manufacturing, like I said, it can like build the best goal, like build the best box for this. Mm -hmm. But it, it can say you you may might not need this box at all. Like just yeah, just yeah. put this box away and do something else. That's yeah. something that I don't think is is still available. Yeah, that makes sense. At least, uh, you know, for the in the early days of computer chess, I don't know uh, if this remains true, but some of the um, even after computers beat humans, the best solution was a sort of like human computer hybrid, uh, not in the Deus Ex, uh, you know, or um, you know, cyborg sense, but in the like just two people, like or a computer and a and a person working together. Um, and so it seems like that's kind of the sort of thing that you're going with with Jarvis in that there's a, a step of of automation of information extraction and collection, but the whole process is not being automated, right? The whole process of managing employees of managing a project is not automated. It's still it's an adjunct. It's a tool that aids somebody who is you know an individual human making those kinds of decisions and capable of that kind of reasoning. Yeah, exactly. It's it's about improving like performance of those people so they can focus on on something more important. And like like some some different example is just in medical field. Uh, mm -hmm. There there are some like uh, medical images that machine learning models can just find some things that doctors can can't. But then on the other way, there there is something that only doctors can see. So it can it can work like best uh, if it's a hybrid thing. Yeah, uh, well, I think actually I have one more question uh, for you, which is, uh, so you're in, uh, uh, have you been using weights and biases as part of your natural language processing model building toolkit? And uh, if so, like, what have you found? What have you found useful? What have you been using? Yeah, so uh, I, I have been using it and I started it actually using it a while ago uh, when we started using that one big model. And mm -hmm. it started like, and it started at first because it took a lot of time to train that big model. And then you had to do like a bunch of different tuning parameters, like either write uh, code yourself. So back then I think it was like mostly just that thing that, that helped uh, the most. So that's how I started using it. And I still find just sweeps, uh, the really, really best to think about it because it just goes through every single possibility and logs everything that, that that's happening during that process and mm -hmm. especially like utilization of cpu gpu and stuff like that was helpful for us because we can see uh if like during like during that case would we need like some sort of uh change in in the future mm -hmm. great yeah i'm glad to hear that the tool was useful i think um the artifacts toolkit is maybe n newer than when you were working on that particular part of the project. It might be helpful for orchestrating that model model pipeline where or the end where you have things that are not just deep learning models that you want to you know combine together and, and uh, communicate with one another. Um, but yeah, well, uh, thanks so much, uh, Alexa, for staying up late over there in Serbia to be able to come on and, and talk with folks and answer questions live. Uh, um, and it's a really cool and exciting tool. And I look forward to seeing, uh, you know, how you guys grow and, uh, and, and make great use of it. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And it was also fun to hear from Richard, what he's doing. And like, I mean, just that sort of, uh, kind of competition, but it's also like you earn, even if you don't like completely win, it's, it's, it's really interesting thing to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for coming, Alexa. And thanks to uh, our audience on Zoom and on YouTube for coming by. Uh, in, I hope to see you all again in two weeks uh, when I'll be giving a talk and Chirag Agarwal of uh, Harvard will be here to talk about his variants of gradient paper. So 